Hi everyone, my name is Sunny Handel. I'm a journalist uh, and commentator based in the UK. Um, I've been writing um, for about 15, 20 years for most of the UK newspapers. Um, I'm also on the board of Vodfas, uh, an advocacy organization uh, looking at drug reform in the UK. I'm based here in London. I have a fantastic panel with me today. Talk about how social justice and equity can be brought into cannabis, the cannabis space in Europe. And we've got uh, perspectives from all over the world. Um, with me today is Al Harrington, who is CEO of Viola Brands, Neve Eastwood, who is Executive Director of Release, a charity, Cyrus Engerer, MEP, who is Member of Parliament for Morta, and Aras Azadian, who is CEO of Avicana. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, so I, I guess I'll start with why, we'll start with you, Neve, why we need a social uh, justice and equity sort of um, approach to uh, cannabis. Um, and I know that you, have, your charity has done some research into this space. Can you just briefly tell us about what you found and why this is so needed for the cannabis space? Well, uh, thanks, Sunny, and, and pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to be part of this panel today. Um, and I think it's a really timely discussion. It's 50 years of the Misuse of Drugs Act, 1971 in the UK. My organization was actually set up in 1967, just before that act. And so over the years, we've been able to document how drug prohibition and cannabis prohibition have impacted on communities. And in 2018, we produced a report that showed that um, in terms of drug law enforcement, it's very much focused on cannabis possession offences. So it's estimated that sort of one in three police stop and searches are for cannabis. And it disproportionately impacts on black communities in the UK, with black people nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs. They're 11 times more likely to be prosecuted for cannabis possession offences. Um, and this is despite the fact that, that drug use amongst that community is much lower than the white population. So this is really about how the drug laws have been used as a form of kind of social and racial control. Um, and, and really, we have to start to have conversations about what solutions look like and that solutions that are very much premised in repairing those harms of drug policy reform. And there's a lot of learning at the minute from the US that we can have a bigger discussion about here. But I think, you know, if, if we're honest about saying that you know, the opportunities that have developed in cannabis regulation and cannabis markets have come from us evidencing that drug policy, drug prohibition does not work. And so therefore, if we're pointing to those harms, we have to have solutions that seek to repair those harms. And when I spoke to you before this discussion, you offered me three solutions. You said that these three things are what we need to see. Could you tell me more about that? Well, definitely. And I think, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Al and Iris and Cyrus have to say. And Al probably has more experience in the U.S. context. But, I, you know, I think when we first saw cannabis legalization coming out of the U.S., we expected a very hyper commercialized model to be the dominant narrative. But we're um, almost 10 years on from the first states legalizing. And in fact, the dominant narrative in the U.S. now is one that is premised on social equity and the three principles that we are talking about in our organization, learning from states like Massachusetts and New York most recently, is very much focused on making sure that people who have been criminalized for activities within the market are released from prison and that there is an expungement of records. Secondly, that decriminalization of cannabis possession offenses is also married within the system of cannabis regulation. So decriminalization is making sure that people aren't policed or prosecuted for possession of cannabis that is procured from outside of a regulated market. That has to be part of it. Otherwise, the same people who were thrown under the bus of prohibition will continue to be thrown under a bus. Um, and finally, market participation. How do we make sure that people have the uh, resources and the skills and the opportunities to participate in the market. And as I said, I think Al probably will have more to talk about that experience from the US context. Yeah, let's do that. Al, thanks for joining us. Tell us a little bit more about Viola Labs and what you think is, you know, the, the stuff that Europe can learn from the United States 
and the stuff that we shouldn't be doing that is yeah. being done in the United States. Yeah, I think the main thing to your point is, you know, is about really learning, you know, from the mistakes of, you know, the United States to help your programs obviously be uh, more successful because the intention of the, the intentions of social equity is to create, you know, wealth, right? And generational wealth, you know, saying when you think about how big this industry is and the opportunities that are within it. And, you know, to uh, Neve's point, you know, some of the main things is, you know, when you get this opportunity, it's like now what, right? Because we are pioneering the industry, right? It's not like you can just go up the street or to your neighbor and ask for advice on how to grow a plant or how to run a business or how to operate in a highly reg regulated um, environment. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, some of the things that, you know, the Europe should, people, the Europeans should think about as they roll out this program, you know, one of the main things that we've dealt with here in the United States is, um, you know, the education around, you know, these licenses and how to operate them and also the resources around them. Right. Because, you know, when you give people that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs, they come from communities where they never really had any opportunities, any outlets or anything like that. So now you say, here's a license that, you know, you need a couple million dollars to be able to stand up the business. It's like, where am I going to get that from? You know what I'm saying? I've struggled to be able to, you know, save $10,000 in my bank account, let alone, you know, have resources or relationships where I can go raise millions of dollars, right? So I think that that's where, you know, the government's should be able to use tax revenue money from cannabis, especially because they're going to give these bigger companies these licenses out the gate. We already see like in the United States, you know, we have states like Maryland and different things like that, where, you know, they did $700 million in revenue with 14 operators, you know, for cultivation and different things like that. All that tax revenue, where is it going? Right. It should go to back into these programs to be able to build more businesses so that obviously the revenues will continue to grow. And then where you give where's that money going back to? And I feel like, you know, places like New York, um, you know, I actually like, you know, where they the path that they're going down. But we have to continue to stand on them and, and, and be a part of the process to make sure that a lot of the intent that they have in the legislation uh, actually happens. Because if it's yeah. happening, it's, it is equitable for our community, right? When you see that they're going to give out interest-free loans, they're going to give a lot of the support that these people will need to be able to stand up these businesses and be able to run them. Because I can say from experience, um, even if I had to run my license by myself, I would have been in trouble, right? But, you know, thank God that I was able to have some resources, be able to hire some really smart people to help us stay compliant and be able to be here 10 years later, you know, still operating in this highly regulated business that there's a lot of shakes and turns and pivots <laughs> that we've had to make. But, you know, like I said, you know, we were able to have some of the resources to be able to do that and most people can't. So, you know, what, that, those are just like two of the main things is, is all around education. You know what I'm saying? I think that, you know, every question you ask me is going to come back to the education side is like how much of a foundation can we give these social equity applicants from a basis of knowledge? And then also what resources can we offer them? Because um, once again, here in the U.S., uh, the investors that are investing in these social equity licenses, most times, 95% of the time, are predatory investors, right? Uh, they end up, these the people that have these licenses end up owning 3 5% of the license. And, you know, the first time that they default or anything like that, you know, potentially they can be run out of their business. And, you know, that's not what the intention of social equity is. It's for yeah. ownership, you know, and it's for uh, giving p these people, us, an opportunity to uh, run profitable businesses and then give back to our community. Because, you know, we feel like, I feel like for sure that uh, the cannabis plant, you know, was used to destroy our community. But if we have, you know, a real equitable opportunity and position in the space, we can rebuild it. Great. Aras, I'll, I'll come to you next. Um, wh what is your view on uh, the space that we're in, uh, in terms, and how would you, what would you want to see more in terms of social equity when it comes to cannabis space in, in Europe, especially? Oh. Are you having problems? He's on mute. <laughs> there we go. For some reason, it won't let me. Uh... Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. It, it's fine. You're still on mute, though. <laughs> I'll answer for him. 
I'll do my <laughs> Ross voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, well, let, let's go to Cyrus first. I, I think we'll have to wait for uh, Aras to come back in. Cyrus, you're an MEP in Malta, and you're watching, um, you know, not just your own country, but also Europe grapple with this um, issue of cannabis legalization. Where are we headed, and uh, what are you worried about? So thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this interesting discussion today. Um, as a member of the European Parliament, yes, I do focus on all of the European Union, but then obviously I have a special interest in, in my country, which at the end of the day I'm representing. I, I, there is no clear way in which Europe is heading to. There is no harmonized way in which Europe is heading to. Each member state has its own policy. This is not the competence of the European Union, and each and every member state uh, devises its own policies with regards to cannabis use. Uh, it is a very timely debate also here in Malta because uh, the Maltese government, as promised before the elections four years ago, um, is uh, just finished the consultation period uh, for cannabis for, for personal use. Uh, and uh, the government was proposing in its white paper uh, decriminalization, but not uh, legalization and no uh, legal avenue for users to actually buy uh, the product. However, uh, as a party, uh, the Labour Party, which is in government uh, and it has a majority government on its own, we decided to contribute to the discussion as a party itself and we're proposing uh, legalization uh, and we're currently delving into the different options that we have for legalization. And uh, I think that there are two routes, basically, in which we could go to. Uh, one is the American, maybe Dutch route, which we have seen uh, the commercialization, let's say, of um, cannabis um, buying. Uh, or else the route that Spain, for instance, had taken, and which we have seen also in South America and Uruguay, for instance, where you get cannabis social clubs. And what I am advocating and what I have um, recommended um, the government to do is to um, invest in, uh, I would call them cannabis social enterprises, because at the end of the day, it is an entrepreneurial uh, way of doing things as well. Now, I believe that uh, people should be able um, to buy the products that they are going to use, to know what is in the product, and be able to consume it uh, without having to resort to the black market to buy um, their own product. So I think that is one of the most important things. At the end of the day, um, those people who use cannabis will still uh, buy cannabis. And let's make sure that, as Al said before, uh, at the end of the day, this will lead to revenue for the country, which then could be spent. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of the European Parliament who serves in the Public Health Committee. So public health is very much important. There could be revenues that could be used in the public health realm and also in education, which is absolutely important. And you said that Spain is a good model to follow. Um, what is a bad model? Who is pushing a bad model across uh, Europe, you think? Uh, I personally do not like the Dutch model, so uh, what they have done in the Netherlands. Um, Whilst it was uh, a country which uh, was at the forefront of the move towards um, decriminalizing and somehow legalizing uh, cannabis, can cannabis in certain regions of, uh, of the Netherlands, uh, I myself would prefer to go away from Big Pharma and see that uh, there is social equity when it comes to uh, the use of cannabis. Uh, and what we are proposing also in our country is the availability of users to grow their own plants. Um, and as a government, we have proposed here in Malta that each and every person can have um, four plants uh, at the moment. So that's the initial way we're going to. I think it is a good start. Um, that said, I do believe that, obviously, when you say that a person can grow his or her own plant, uh, at the same time, there are a number of conditions that are being imposed through the, the, the white paper speaking of conditions. And that means that not everyone would be able to grow the plants that they need uh, within their households. So uh, one good thing to, uh, to make sure that everyone that needs access would be given access is to create some kind of social enterprises that could, um, it, it's the pooling of resources. And I think that is the way forward um, for my country, but I believe it is the 
best way forward. Uh, in, from the studies I have done on this topic, uh, I really like what has happened in Spain, uh, although it's still at initial stages anyway, uh, but Uruguay, I believe, is a, is a very good um, example of what could be done. Aras, I'll come to you now. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell us more about um, what you do and also what you think is missing from the European space in terms of social equity or what you'd like to see. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for having me. I sorry about the audio issues earlier. Um, so, so I'm, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Canada Work, a biopharmaceutical company that is focused on cannabinoid-based medicine. Uh, we work very closely with Alan and his companies in the United States, and we have the pleasure of collaborating with them at multiple levels. Um, my, my position on, on the social equity part, it, 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 it's a bit complex, but I, I think there's a lot of learnings that we can take from the Canadian federal model, which wasn't, in my opinion, done the best way, and from the American state-by-state -state model, which I don't think was done the best way. And I think something that Al pointed out, which is, the, the predatory investors, and I'm talking about, I'm going to focus specifically on the opportunity side and from an opportunity perspective, you know, because cannabis was a new industry for, for, for a lot of people, including myself and Al, we saw this as an opportunity to do something better for patients, for consumers, for our communities. However, in the earlier years, this was essentially hijacked by, by the capital markets, by the investors, by the hedge funds, by a lot of people that simply saw this as a new industry. And in a quick one to make money off of and if you look at the boards and you look at the management teams and you look at the executives and the owners of these companies there's very little diversity you know so i think that was one of the first challenges so i think from a government perspective there needs to be some assistance there needs to be some support we can treat this because it's a new industry as a blank slate if we do things properly and provide some sort of equal opportunity whether that's in the form of you know funds that are developed or put together to help you know, uh, entrepreneurs that are coming from more diverse background to get a chance, or whether that's incubation programs that are designed for these small, more small startup companies, something that I know Al and the guys are applying for Viola. I think those are some of the solutions, but there certainly was is a problem in, in Canada and the United States in the way that the industry has been built, essentially hijacked from, from, my, from my perspective by the capital market community. So there's a lot to learn from that. I think Europe, because it's predominantly taking a medical approach, um, can take a much more regulated process in using the tax revenues and the tax dollars to put in some of these support systems that will allow, you know, start smaller groups to build companies up. And, and that these, this could be much more diverse groups. My last comment, and, and I think, you know, coming from uh, uh, a diverse background myself, people like Al and I didn't have as much support in the earlier years, but we did it. You know, we built these vertical integrations and we built companies and brands. Uh, however, uh, I don't think everyone has to necessarily follow the exact same pathway. I don't think they need as much resources. I think for 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 the more diverse communities, I think they can focus on maybe some of the ancillary products or some of the ancillary services or some of the ancillary technologies because this industry is not just about what you grow and what you sell. You know, and I think if we if people take a more innovative approach to providing services or providing marketing support consulting whether it's technology or app whatever the case is i think there's a lot of ancillary areas that don't require as much resources to enter the industry so i'll, I'll pause there yeah i it's funny because i'm hearing a lot of criticism of canada from a lot of different uh, sources i know i was speaking to neve earlier she also is criticizing the Canadian approach. Al, do you think that uh, the Canadian approach isn't doing too well? You, you, you would criticize the Canadian approach too, or what do you think they're doing okay? I have no problems with Canada. No, <laughs> I think they're all, I mean, I think they're all everywhere has, has its issues, right? Once again, like I said, you know, we're we, 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 we pioneering the industry, right? And when you think about uh, politicians, you know, um, I think historically they're not entrepreneurs right so they really don't understand entrepreneurial pain and they don't really understand a lot of the legislation that they're putting on these businesses are really um you know making it extremely hard to operate these businesses you know what i'm saying when you think about it just in the united states the tax structures and you know different things like that it, it makes it very very difficult 
and especially when you're you know already teetering the line when you're you know somewhere where it's federally illegal um still right in canada obviously you know they you know blew the doors off you know when nationally legal but you know you know, from the outside looking in, it seems very, very difficult to be able to run a really successful business when you can't do traditional marketing and different things like that. When, you know, uh, some of the important things about cannabis is trying to get it to the customer as fresh as you can, right? Um, in Canada, you got to send it to a distribution center and then the government distributes it. So there's a lot of different things. And when you think about that, like, I, I don't even know how you can even do social equity when you have to, uh, you know, have an environment like that. You know what I'm saying to be able to actually participate. So, like Arad said, you know, it, I guess it's really about, you know, kind of looking at the country or the state that you live in and trying to figure out, you know, how you can participate. Because to his point, you know, that's you know, everybody can't grow, right? You know, growing is going to become commoditized very soon, right? So, what other ways can we have impact in the industry? And you, you know, you have manufacturing, you have packaging, you have tech, uh, you have disposal, you have testing. You know, these are all things that, you know, in every, every state or every country is going to be needed. And can you figure out how you can, you know, uh, participate in that way? You know what I'm saying? Once again, in an equitable way so that, you know, you can, you know, participate in this booming in this booming industry. Sure. I mean, not that I want to uh, go against Canada or anything, but I, would, I do want to bring in Neve on this on this point about what you do think are the criticisms of the Canadian approach uh, to uh, to bringing in legalization? I think you're still on mute, sorry. So um, I, th I think the problem with Canada, it was very, I mean, like, I agree with Iris and, and Al's commentary on Canada, and you know, generally no problems with Canada, but I'm not a big fan of their, their uh, cannabis regulatory framework. Um, and it was very driven by kind of capital predatory approaches in Canada. There was no conversation about issues around social equity and participation in the market. Even more concerning was the lack of discussion that really um, focused on repairing those criminal justice harms that had happened. So, for example, when a lot of the states in the US, we saw um, the inclusion of an expungement of records approach making sure that people who have been criminalized were no longer treated as criminals in what was now a legal activity which is absolutely right but in canada that conversation didn't even take part of the the, the policy uh, workup um in developing the, the the legal framework for for cannabis regulation even more concerning was the fact that there's actually now more as i understand criminal laws related to cannabis than existed before regulation came into effect. So, um, and they also criminalized possession of cannabis outside of the regulated market. And I think that's really problematic. Um, and I think again, from the US and some of the US states agree again with Raz that many of them have been very focused on capital opportunities and have really not focused on kind of so social equity. But what I would say is every US state at least does not criminalize people for possession of cannabis outside of the uh, legal market. So if you're in possession of cannabis from the illicit market, it is not an offense. It's not a civil offense. It's not a criminal offense. And that's a really important part of the whole picture. It's not just about regulation. It's about making folks, making sure folks who are likely to be policed and harassed and arrested are continue to be policed and harassed and arrested. And I think that's a real problem in Canada. And then just the sheer uh, cost of participating in the market. There are very few licenses to enter the lottery uh, to get licenses. I think it's a quarter of a million US dollars or Canadian dollars. I mean, all of this just sets it up for, frankly, rich white folks getting richer. And, you know, and I, I didn't get into drug policy reform for those purposes. <laughs> So I, I think there's an interesting divide between people who are entrepreneurs and looking at this from a very entrepreneurial space and people who want a more, uh, say, less less entrepreneurial approach, like, for example, Spain. I mean, I lived in Spain and actually none of the cannabis there are even for profits. You know, they are non-profit enterprises and um, the government doesn't allow you to not only doesn't allow you to advertise, but doesn't even allow you to make much money from uh, uh, you know, working with cannabis. 
Well, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Al. So, like, there's an interesting, you know, different approach. Um, I don't know which way the UK is going, but there's certainly, you know, I'd be interested in knowing whether Europe is going to take the sort of the California model, or are we going to go down the Sp Spain model, right? So, and that's a that, uh, that's something that actually Europe has not really thought about. We're just talking about decriminalization, but we're not talking about is it going to be an entrepreneurial approach or is it going to be a non-profit approach? Now, Cyrus, you said earlier that you wanted a non-profit approach uh, focused more on Spain. Would you, well, what would you say to people like Al who want to come in and make money from this debate? Hmm. We have, it's, it's interesting because we're having I that debate, just we're having that debate at the moment in, in my country, Malta. So uh, we, with regards to, for instance, medical cannabis, we have gone uh, the entrepreneurial way, the profit-making way. In fact, we have a number of companies that have opened up in Malta during the past uh, couple of years where um, they, are, uh, they have invested here, they are operating from here, and they're selling all across uh, not only the European Union, but globally. So uh, that is one of the routes that we have gone to uh, when it comes to medical cannabis. And, and I invite Al to actually look into it and maybe um, invest also over here when it comes to the medical um, and to the medical side of cannabis. However, um, we are making a distinction when it comes to cannabis for personal use. And I think that over there, um, we must make sure, first of all, the, the, the first thing is um, in the debate, the war on drugs has failed. I think what we have done uh, as a, a, a planet during the past uh, 50, 60 years was something that led us to the state we're in today. Uh, and that had to be um, fought. I believe that we need a human rights approach when it comes to cannabis. And I believe that, um, first of all, uh, we shouldn't treat people who make use uh, of cannabis as criminals. At the end of the day, they are harming no one. Um, it is a personal choice that a person makes and at the end of the day affects only that particular person. Uh, now, moving on from that and replying to, to your question, I believe that anyone who wants to have access should have access to the plant at a reasonable price and know exactly uh, what the strand is, uh, what the strain is, what, what there is in the actual um, plant that he is consuming. And I do agree that there should be a way in which the pooling of resources between the different uh, people into a social enterprise could, could work. I am not excluding the fact that there could be entrepreneurs. That is a good thing and we do promote business. But at the same time, those people who would like to grow their own um, product, they should be able to do that um, in their homes. And if they, they, if they live in, a, in an environment where they can't uh, grow their own plant, then they can pool their resources together in a social enterprise in order to have that plant. So I think that the two concepts are not mutually exclusive. We can have both uh, at the same time, uh, but making sure that the individual can have the choice to decide which kind of product he wants. Aras, I'm going to come back to you, uh, if you don't mind. I, I, I'd love to know what, if you've done any lobbying in Europe or how you see the European market developing and what are you worried about in terms of uh, whether it's policy or um, you know, whether it's uh, in terms of commercial side, what worries you or what, and what excites you? So, so, so we're, we're a global company uh, and today we operate in, in South America and, and North America, so Canada, the United States, Colombia, we're expanding into Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, and that's been the predominant focus of the company. We have obviously looked at UK, Europe. We're going to be launching one of our skincare lines in the UK over the next couple of months. So we are active. And what I've noticed from the European market, which is, I think, an important topic, is it's generally going to be medical, right? I mean, there's, there's of course, going to be personal use, but they're not, I don't believe they're going to take, at least most of the countries in the short term are not going to be taking an adult use legislation that, for example, Canada took. And I think if we're taking a medical only approach in the short term, uh, it's a very different discussion because on the adult use side, you have the consumers. You have the consumers who have a preference and you have a consumer who can drive a business. And Al has demonstrated at a, at a substantial leadership position that 
if you are authentic and you're supporting a minority movement and social equity and and, and you're providing consumers with an option, they're going to vote for your product and they're going to buy your product. And Biola has been very impressive in doing that. On the medical side, the consumer is not picking, you know, what is the most socially equitable brand. And they're looking at the best medicine for them, right? So it's a very different approach. And on that front, it's going to have to be some legislation, some support from either the government and also from, from industry to provide, again, funding, support to allow companies that are that are coming from a social equitable background, from a diversity background, a chance to compete. And I don't know, to be frank, we don't know what kind of support that is already in place for that of diversity in Europe. We're not seeing much of it. And I, I would hate to see the same thing that happened in Canada happen in, 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 in Europe, where on the adult use side, we, we really don't have any authentic social equity or minority brands. There's a few that are coming out now that are more focused on the ab aboriginals and the inclusion of aboriginals in Canada. But Viola, and, and that's why we're supporting Al's launch of Viola in Canada, will be in my position the real most dominant authentic brand supporting that. So I would hate to see that happen in Europe. I hope that they, on the medical side, that they, they, they do form uh, legislation that has included and the, if there is an adult use site, then I think you do need industry there to back up the consumer brands that will have that follow because, you know, again, Bio is a proof of concept for that. Well, Al, I want to ask you the same question. Are you, are you focused on Europe? Um, are you thinking about expanding to Europe? Um, and, uh, you know, what do you, is there anything that worries you or excites you about what's going on in Europe? Uh, you're on mute, sorry. Yeah, I think Europe is uh, very exciting. You know, I've seen some other brands like uh, I think Cookies is now uh, has something, I think, in Spain or whatever. But, um, you know, for me, I think that uh, the U.S. is such a big bear to tackle. You know, I've kind of decided that I think strategic partnerships is probably the fastest way to growth. And, you know, that's why, you know, uh, partnering with Raz, you know, is very strategic for us, right? You know, we're starting off in Canada, but you hear him, you know, he's breaking down international barriers, you know, pretty much every day, you know, continue to span this footprint. And, you know, when you have two people who interest align and, you know, we're on the same page at the end of the day, you know, um, you know, as he expands, you know, there's opportunities for us to continue to expand together and vice versa here in the United States, right? So I just feel like, you know, I, you know, I think, I played in the NBA 16 years, right? You know, four years of high school. So 20 years of team sports. I know how valuable, you know, uh, putting a strong team together is. You put a strong team together, you win championships. And when you win championships, everybody know your name forever, right? And I think that all what we're all working on here is legacy opportunities, right? You know, that we're long love past when we're gone, you know, but, you know, hopefully we're setting up, you know, infrastructures and foundations for people to be able to thrive for forever you know and um you know as we look at these new opportunities you know i will probably look at it more through a partnership uh lens and you know arise is you know one of the guys that we're working with right now and we're just looking for you know whatever the best opportunities for us you know as a company cyrus coming back to you what what are you looking for in terms of entrepreneurs now like you know, what is, um, if an entrepreneur came to you and said, you know, I want to um, work in uh, Malta in terms of expanding opportunities and, and reaching out, do you worry that um, like, you know, like big brands, uh, sorry, big uh, corporate companies are coming, going to come in first and uh, take over that space? How are you going to make sure that if Malta moves towards decriminalization, legalization, a regulation and maybe even sets a sort of a template for the rest of Europe, right? Yes, we, we have a, a very good opportunity to do that at the moment, being um, the current member state in the European Union that is actually working on this right now. So we're writing whatever will be happening in the future. And we know that we have a lot of eyes that are on us, seeing exactly what, what we are doing and how we're going to do that. We have been uh, in the past few years, we have become uh, leaders when it comes to civil rights. And in my opinion, as I said already, we should take a human rights approach when it comes to cannabis for personal use. That said, um, I live in a country which is um, very much um, adapted towards having big companies uh, moving to Malta and working from here to reach not only Europe, but also Africa. We're situated in the perfect position to do that. And I think that 
we are at the perfect place at the moment when it comes to legislation as well to make sure that we are attracting these companies to come here. I think that uh, apart from obviously the, the beneficial tax system that we have, the fact that we're in between two continents and therefore um, uh, be, um, there, there's easy access to different markets and also the fact that as we speak and as we're currently legislating, uh, we are a country that is uh, moving out of COVID, getting um, herd immunity and therefore being ready to and safe to go to business once again. I think that that's a good thing. Uh, now, what apart from that, um, I think that the legislation that we're looking at when it comes to cannabis for personal use, at the end of the day, no big company will come to Malta to supply the local market. It's too small. We're only 450,000 people. Uh, and therefore, no big company can see huge profits uh, from such a small place. But I think this would be uh, the right place with the right regulations to reach the rest of Europe. Uh, and our policy can then move on and, and uh, flow towards other, other member states. We have seen this happening already with more civil rights than spilling over to other member states. And I think that what we're currently doing with cannabis can have um, that impact as well. As I said, uh, as a country, um, we're very much open for business and we look forward to have such big companies coming and, and working from here. Uh, however, I understand that the market is too small. Right. The market is, I agree with that. But, you know, given that you're still in the European Union and then you have uh, transportation of goods to other parts of Europe very easy and, you know, all the rest of it, um, it does make it actually quite, um, surely it makes it quite a, a good launch base for companies to come to Malta, set up a, a way, uh, sort of a, an operation there as a way to then go across Europe. But I go back to the question, how are you going to make sure that companies coming to Malta have a social equity angle or a, sm or a, or a, or a, a, a strong social equity sort of uh, approach? From, from, from my end, that is what I'm advocating to governments to do. Um, at the end of the day, um, we need those companies that have a, a social equity perspective working in, in, the, in the way that they work. Uh, it is important for us, and I'm sure that it is important for this socialist government at the, the, at the end of the day that looks towards social equity in everything that we do. So we are working with uh, Malta Enterprise. Um, the government is working with Malta Enterprise to see that even those companies that are uh, interested in investing uh, and launching their business here in Malta to reach the rest of Europe, at the end of the day, have that social uh, perspective in place. It is something that we do naturally as a country, I believe. Uh, and we need to have regulations that um, incentivize business to uh, to move here, but incentivize business to, at the, at the end of the day, make it profitable to business to be social equitable. And I think that that is the right formula to have when it comes to attracting business here. Okay. Uh, Neve, I'll put that to you then. If you were advising the government of Malta and saying, okay, you guys um, are going to uh, look to legalize uh, cannabis, what sort of laws or regulations would you like to see in place to make sure that there is a strong social equity angle to this uh, space? So I think it's about looking at how the market operates and how we prioritize uh, participatory opportunities within the market for people who have been um, involved in the illicit trade, for example. So like, I think we have to accept the illicit trade does bring a source of income to some of the most deprived communities in our in our countries. Um, and if we take that away from those communities, we will leave them in further, um, more entrenched deprivation. And so how do we think about, you know, bringing that expertise? And I think Al spoke to it earlier on, you know, you're creating a new market where a lot of traditional industry doesn't know the how-tos. They don't know how to grow cannabis really well. They don't have that experience. So how do we transition these folks into that licit space? Um, and for example, that's been done in Jamaica. There are some laws there around prioritizing uh, farmers in Jamaica 
to participate in the medical market there. So I don't think that's that hard. And what you can do practically is say, right, within our legislation, so many percentage of our licenses, so much of a certain percentage of licenses will go to people who have uh, criminal records, who will be um, who, who have been in living communities that have been over policed or ride drug laws. So there's ways that we can do that. We make sure absolutely, as Al said, that they have the resources and the skills and the support to do that. So it's about loans. It's about investment. It's about helping people work out how to navigate the tax system. You know, it's how do you have good human resources policies in place. So it's about making sure we have that kind of fora of um, support in order to uh, maximize participation um, from folks who have been, as I say, over-criminalized and, and over-policed. Um, and also to Aris brought up the different points within the market that people can participate. It's not just about selling and growing. Massachusetts, for example, have just developed a whole stream of work around delivery licenses. And that's really going to focus in and providing opportunities where there is a lack of unemployment and a lack of opportunity. And that's not to say that this should be the only opportunity for these communities. It's just that that opportunity shouldn't be removed. And then when we look at taxation, taxation should be investing in those communities that has suffered so much at the hands of drug prohibition. Let's give people opportunities to engage in other sectors in our society. It's not just about getting those who have been involved in the illicit market into the illicit, it's like get them into all industries. So I think there's a whole wrath of kind of practical things that legislation could do and regulations could do in order to make sure that that participation happens. Most importantly, I think you have folks who have been impacted participating in those regulatory frameworks. So they are on those regulation boards, they are making those laws, they are advocating and understanding what communities need. Uh, Al, I want to come back to you uh, and just ask you one thing. What 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 states are doing stuff that you don't like, right? Because all the all the states have different laws, and you must be looking at some states and being like, "You guys are doing this badly." You know, I don't like what you're doing here. Um, which which I mean, state that is the one? I mean, the one that I pick on a lot, I think, is, is where I live. Um, is California? I think the California program has really been a disaster. Now I'm in the whole state, but definitely the Los Angeles. Um, you know, they still haven't issued any of the social equity licenses. And this program started off four or five years ago. And the impact is is just as bad as the impact of the war on drugs on these people, right? I mean, people have sacrificed, they mortgaged their homes, they did all kinds of things to be able to hold real estate, you know, for the last four years. And a lot of them have fallen by the wayside because they just wasn't able to continue to pay rent on a bin that they never knew when they were actually gonna, you know, be able to get a license. Um, I think part of their due diligence process in regards to being able to sniff out the predatory uh, contracts, because I know for a fact that there was companies that were literally standing in front of VAs and different places like that, like asking people, hey, you wanna, you know, make $3,000 a month? Okay, let me use you as my social equity applicant and, and you know, different things like that. Um, and then some states in, here in the United States still haven't even uh, adapted any type of social equity. So when you think about like, you know, all the awareness we're bringing around it, that some of these states still haven't even started to even think about addressing it, is just still a, a crime, right? Um, name and shame, I'll name and shame, Who, who's not doing that? <laughs> a lot of these, a lot of these marks. I mean, you know, some of them are now starting to think about it now, like Colorado now. But you know, Colorado is a ten-year-old industry, right? You know, but um, you know, it's just I think overall, um, you know, we would love to get to the point where we're kind of operating under somewhat of the same laws and it not be so different from state to state. You know what I'm saying? Because I think it would make it a lot easier for you know the multi-state operator, you know, someone like myself. And then, you know, for these people that are able to get the license and have relationships with other people that they can, you know, start to build something that could become a lot bigger than what it is for just one single individual hold uh, a license holder, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, the overall approach to social equity just needs to be looked at again. Um, but I think that when they do it this time, I think that social equity people black people in particular need to be in the room and before you go and make a rule about how things can be impacted for black people and you're not black i just feel like 
I mean, what are we talking about here? Like, you know, and I and I talk about that a lot because it just makes no sense. I'm like, there's a room full of, you know, and I'm not raising anything, but the room full of white people saying how something should look for a community of people that they've never been around or have ever had to deal with. You know what I'm saying? There's a huge problem with that. So I think that that's one of the first things that they can do is put people in there that they're trying to affect, have them in the room giving their opinion so that, you know, that when these things do roll out, they make sense and they are uh, going to get people, put people in a position to be successful. Right, right. Okay, I'm going to get the last uh, final words quickly. If we can do like a closing thoughts, Aras and Cyrus, just, um, or Aras, actually, yeah, you've spoken a lot less than others. Just give us your final thoughts on what we need to do right now in terms of social equity uh, for cannabis across Europe. And then we need to close off, I think. Well, thanks for that. Um, I, I would say just to wrap up, we need to learn from, again, the mistakes in Canada, learn from the mistakes in the U.S. I think the government should bring on advisors such as I to, to give them perspective on all of this. And I think you need to bring in the experts for it. But I go back to a very utopian concept of this is a new industry. We have blank slate. Let's do it right. You know, let's look at it from the right perspectives, get the right advice, write the, write the, the, the correct legislation and build incubation systems and funding and resources so we can do this right. It's very rare for us at this stage of you know, human civilization to get such an opportunity to have such an impactful industry start from scratch. You know, this is the right moment and I, I, I won't change the topic and discuss environmental sustainability and all that stuff, but that all could be considered. We can do this right and we can learn from everything that people like Al and I have gone through. And I think we should be part of that process to advise. You know, and I, I think I would just leave it there. Uh, that's good. And Cyrus, 30 seconds. What's yeah, the... I, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll continue with what I said. We have two routes that have already taken place in different countries. We can learn from both routes to find a new way of how to do this. And I think that having a balance and knowing exactly what we can do, because now we have learned from others, I think we're at the right spot at this moment in time to have that third way of doing things. Europeans love the third way. Thanks so much for my, uh, uh, thanks so much to the panel, to me, to Al, Cyrus and Aras. Thank you for joining me. My name is Sunny Hundel and thank you to Prohibition Partners for hosting this discussion. Very much.